All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Corky's Corner, Episode 9. Joining me, of course, is my co-host. You know all the uh, qualifications he has. Whether they're legitimate qualifications, that is up to you. But uh, is my co-host, of course, my dad, Mike Corky. Too legit to quit, John. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, a lot of hockey news is broken, or by a lot, I mean one major news and then a bunch of contracts that are technically news. But I was going through a lot of the PTOs. We'll cover them, but just some notable ones. We're not going to cover all of them. A lot of them are fr career fringe NHLers anyway, um, who are depth. And, you know, uh, this is hockey as a whole. If it was a specific team, yeah, we'd cover it. But um, well, first, I wanted to start with that. Do you follow women's hockey at all? Uh, mostly in the Olympics. Yeah, I, I would consider the same with the Olympics. It is interesting because the NHL is are now, of course, do you have you been following the news about women's hockey at all? And um, they, have, they started an original six league. Yeah, so I was, uh, yeah, so I kind of went through it. And I do disagree the way a lot of it did. So, like, uh, they just basically got rid of, like, a bunch of teams. I think the Buffalo Buttes were actually a successful organization. And yeah. oh, I get it. The Beauties. Yeah, that that was the point of the name, but that was an actual name. I think they were in the original PWHL, but it was like it almost felt like the union kind of when they merged leagues actually kind of got rid of a lot of those uh, lucrative contracts that the women signed. Um, the union seemed to have gotten rid of them out of spite. So I, I do disagree with how it happened, but for women's hockey to succeed, this is kind of the way it's going to have to happen. So we could get into how it started and everything, but I mean, I'd like women's hockey to grow, but I have some comments on what they're doing. So uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, ah, crap, I don't have the right tab open. So I'll just start here and then... Um, uh, oh, God, I hate the freaking Zoom in the way of my freaking uh, – get out of the freaking way. Um, sorry, everyone, technical difficulties with the stupid – there we go. All right. Uh, let me just uh, – app friendly. Uh, All right. There we go. So here's the perfect kind of graphic I have for it. Um. Zoom is very annoying, so sorry about those technical difficulties. But their original six, as they're calling it, is Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, Boston, and New York. Dad, what are your thoughts on these cities at first? Well, you forgot Minnesota. Um, they definitely, <laughs> they definitely hit the you know the hot, the hot spots for the cities. Um, if you'll no, I mean, and, and they got to keep the travel cost down for a league like this. So it makes a lot of sense that they would just kind of focus on the northeast corner here. I don't know how they're going to do the Minnesota thing, although maybe they figure that they get enough good crowds up there that um, that they they would um, it would be worth the travel. So, I mean, it's all it all makes sense to me. Um, the uh, so. One thing I've been thinking about with women's hockey and how, how to kind of get it started is what's the most popular women's hockey games that are played? The Olympics. Right. So basically what you have is you have that sort of USA versus Canada. And I love that. Everybody loves those games. They're they're The people really get into it. They're, they're um, uh, you know, it's sort of a tribal thing. And if you think back about the origin of sports, what it really was is it was it was like my town is going to put together a team and we're going to barnstorm your team. Right. That's the whole thing of barnstorming. We're going to, be, you know, you your town put uh, together a, uh, a team and we'll, we'll see whose town is better. Right. Like that's that's kind of the origin of sports, not just for hockey, but for everything, uh, every sport. And. I almost think that that would be the best model for women's hockey to start is like that sort of barnstorming and USA and Canada, you can't have a league of two teams. So then I thought, well, what about Western Canada, Eastern Canada, Western U S um, Eastern Canada, maybe, maybe something like that. 
or maybe like Quebec has a team. But the the thing that I think that would be cool about it to get started was you could only play for the team where you live or were born. Right. So that so that it really becomes you really get some of that local pride that you're not going to get. I mean, yeah, Boston, Boston. Oh, they, we got a Boston team. Let's get Boston people behind it. Well, guess what? There's a lot of competition for the sports eyes in Boston. So maybe a different kind of model like the one I'm suggesting might help them get it started up and then they could sort of branch out as the sport becomes more popular. Yeah, for me, I think, I don't know how sustainable it would be just geographical base. Um, I do think they did capitalize it. I think the first thing they could have done is for the draft and for the free agent signings is what I was thinking. After year one, you move away from it. But for year one, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal can only get people from Canada. Boston, New York, and Minnesota can only get people from the U.S. is basically what I was thinking with the how i would do it you know keep the countries there maybe do like a uh, a canadian division of three versus a american division of three and that so it's the best team from canada versus the best team from the u.s in the final to capitalize on that but if you're starting your own league and you know teams are going to want you you want the because sports now a huge appeal is the like the drafting, the trading, the, you know, all the machinations within the organization. That's kind of the selling point now. So I think, you know, while it is good to start out kind of getting the nationally based teams together, you do got to branch out. And I don't think it's sustainable long term uh, for women's hockey. But I do kind of like where your head's at with that. I think uh, I think yeah, I- it doesn't have to be sustainable long term. Right. It uh, it only it only has to sort of get the get the juices flowing and, and get people interested and then they could gradually move away from it. But I think that I think, you know, like the reason that they have these professional leagues is because of the women's Olympic hockey. Right. That that yeah. was it's so popular that they need to stay a little closer to that model. It's just my opinion. I mean, these people are putting their money up, so they're free to do what they want, but they need to stay a little closer to that model. So, you know, it'd be like a Western Canadian team, like I, like I already said, but instead of traveling from city to city for like, you know, like sort of mini tournaments in the, in the various cities. And, and it, and I think that would, you would get more people out for more fans out for uh, tournaments that sort of rotated cities. Yeah, no, I think that is fair. I get what you were saying, so that's why I was thinking. And I do think, I haven't looked at who signed with who. I'm kind of more so going to look at the final rosters because you have three free players, basically, where it's a bidding war who can get the first, uh, like who can get the best three players, and then they do a snake draft. Snake draft, I think, is fun. I think that's a great way to set up your league is uh, snake draft. I mean, that's how fantasy people do it. That's a good way to get fantasy hockey fans on there, which I know is not as prevalent as fantasy football. But I think one thing they kind of missed out on, and I get why they did it, because, like, I've always looked at if I was building an NHL, you know, all the way back in 1920s, what would be the cities I would go to and everything. And, I mean, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto – Boston, not New York for the time, but now, yeah, obviously New York, you put a team there. But at the time, the Garden was not a available arena enough that I would have put a team there. And that's why the Rangers were dog crap for ever. But that's like those are definitely traditional hockey markets, but we're not in that time. I think with 2023, there are cities that I think would have been better options because they don't have hockey teams. And so I kind of wanted to share, you know, I would only do two, uh, but basically what I would do is there are cities that want teams. So instead of putting a team in Montreal, I'd put a women's team in Quebec. Uh, People love hockey in Quebec. I think they would, they could rally behind women's hockey because Gary Bettman does not like the idea of giving them men's hockey. So it's like, all right, Quebec, here's your pro hockey team. The women's team come out, support them. I think Quebec would support women's hockey. I would keep New York and Toronto because it's almost impossible to oversaturate those markets. I think for a little bit closer for travel, uh, Minnesota, Minnesota's going to work. I think Minnesota might end up being the most successful market out of all of them. 
I would maybe go to Milwaukee instead because I think hockey in Milwaukee could work. We've seen it with the AHL. It shocks me the NHL never gave the uh, a traditional hockey market in the U.S. as big as Milwaukee. Wisconsin is a sports stated team, so I think women's hockey could look at that. And why not bring the Whalers logo back for uh, women's hockey? You have women. I with- don't think women would want to be called whales. <laughs> That's I didn't think about that, but I would put a team in Hartford because Connecticut loves hockey. I mean, there's literally a Netflix documentary on a successful team. They could make Denver. a version of. They could make a version of it. The the like a mermaid or something instead of the yeah. whale tail. It would be a mermaid tail. And yeah, but it would instead of the W, it would be an M upside down. Yeah, that, I mean that's what I would do. I would maybe look at more markets in the Northeast that are kind of overlooked by the NHL because the NHL wants to put teams in Arizona, and I'm not being a hypocrite here. Part of it is they want to put teams in Carolina, they want to put teams in Florida. That could be an advantage for women's hockey that I don't think they took advantage of with their original six picks. You know, instead of Boston, put it in Hartford. You still got the New England market, Quebec. You still get the Montreal market a little bit because, according to the NHL, they're the same market anyway. Uh, mm-hmm. But you still get you still get some Montreal fans that would definitely drive up if they want to support women's hockey to Quebec. I mean, New York, and then New York, Ottawa, and Toronto. I keep the same. Would you agree with that stance, or would you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I like I like the way you're thinking there. Go into different. Um... Less, less competitive markets. Um, the biggest uh, the biggest loss for the way they reorganize things is the loss of the Calgary Inferno, which has one of the best logos in sports. Have you seen it? Hang on, are you? Uh, let me make sure you can share your screen. Here. No, no, you do it. You just Google Calgary Inferno. All right. Oh, wow. That is a nice logo. That is actually, you're absolutely right. That is a nice logo. It's got the touch with the Calgary Flames logo right there to the side. That is actually a gorgeous logo. I'm actually a big fan of that. You hit it out of the park with your knowledge there. But yeah, that does suck to be losing that logo. I do imagine the PWHL, if those six teams are a success, their next stop will be the West Coast because you, you want a sports team in L.A. as much as I hate that city and I don't like L.A. teams. They're going to want to put a team in L.A. So then you give Calgary and Edmonton a team and Vancouver so that L.A. team doesn't have to travel as much. So I, I would say that's probably where they're going to go next. But then there's no reason they can't bring that logo back. So hopefully not all is lost with that logo. But it's good. It's great. Yeah, and then I, I I think it's been done to death. I will point out, I do think it would be really cool if women's hockey brought in uh, fit, like the physicality of the men's game. I think it is ridiculous that they can't play full contact hockey, but I appear to be in the minority on women playing full contact hockey. As everyone I've talked to that have been fans of women's hockey say they don't need it. And, you know, I know there's refs that I've talked with in Greensboro who've refed college women's games say they don't need it. So maybe I'm wrong, but that's just uh, my opinion on uh, another way to help with women's hockey is bring in the physicality. Let the team start to really hate each other. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm neutral on it. I, I think they're probably fine without it. They, you know, you can you can call games in such a way that you allow like bumping and and um you know, like almost basketball style, um, without the, without the big crunching hits, you know, and, and not allow those. So, you know, it, it can still be physical and they get heated. I mean, you know, you see the, 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 the American and Canadian women going at it, they get super heated. So I don't think there's any worries about the intensity. Fair enough. All right, but next up, we have some PTO contracts, and I do think with some of these PTO contracts, well, just one of them, we may need to update our predictions on who, on, like, is our team's cup contenders, you know, that tier list that we did, because the Anaheim Ducks are the smartest organization in sports. Of course, they're bringing in one of the best hockey players of all time, Zach Cassian. They're getting him on just a PTO can maybe get him league minimum. 
This is the best move I've seen a team do all offseason in bringing in Zach Cassian. And the Oilers were stupid to uh, not sign Zach Cassian to a PTO. <laughs> Well, I, I I I like the way he plays, but you've seen a change in his play, and I think the concussions, um, I really believe, have uh, have finally you know sort of diminished him as a player. I, I I've, you watch him play, he just doesn't have an edge at all anymore. So you're you're hoping for the 2017 uh, run the San Jose Sharks out of the building, Zach Cassian. That person doesn't exist anymore. No, I agree. I, I agree. I do. I do meme how much I love Zach Cassian because, like, everyone has that one player that's one of their favorites of all time. That if you told other people, everyone would be like, "Huh, mine is Zach Cassian." I love Zach Cassian for that running. It really is that running San Jose out of the building game, where I just I was like, if I ever made the NHL, which don't get me wrong, never was going to make the NHL. Zach Cassian would be the exact player I ended up being a little bit shorter than the rest of the league, but just could f- be physical with anyone. So I'm always a fan of Zach Cassian. I do wish Zach Cassian the best. Of course, I don't actually think he's as much of a game changer as I have hyped him up to be. But two interesting ones from Edmonton, and I honestly would have picked these guys anyway, uh, even though they were not, uh, even though they were signed to your team. And that is Brandon Sutter and Sam Gagne. I, I do think it is a little weird uh, in that I forgot to write him down, but like I am a little not Sam Gagne. Sam Gagne is an Edmonton kid, but Carolina brought in Nathan Bellew and uh, uh, and Ed, Edmonton, who's a defenseman, which I don't think a defenseman that's a fringe NHLer is going to crack Carolina's roster. But Edmonton brings in Sam Gagne and Brandon Sutter. I don't think Edmonton needs forward depth. I think they need uh, defensive depth. But I'm curious, do you disagree with me on that? Well, no, they have they have seven defensemen that uh, that are legit playoff proven NHL players. Philip Broberg being the young guy, so that uh, that you know still kind of has to prove himself. But he did play in the playoffs, and Vincent Dearne struggled a little bit in the playoffs last year. But he was awesome for a guy that had been called up at 26 years old uh, in the regular season. Um, both guys will be better. They can make a move at the deadline if they need to. But I think that with their seven defensemen, they're they're set. Um, they're going to have to run a 21-man uh, roster because of salary cap considerations. So they have 11 forwards. They're only going to be able to have 12. Um, and... They're going to be uh, one one spot for three players, uh, or actually four players. These two on their PTOs, both are legit candidates for a ver- variety of reasons. Um, they signed a guy, Lane Peterson, to a league minimum. Um, he's kind of a AHL, NHL tweener, but right now he's like actually a rostered uh, contracted player. So he kind of has the inside track. They can send him down, and that maybe if one of these guys beats him out, uh, then they'll be, they'll then he'll be down. And the other guy is uh, the Oilers uh, rookie Raphael Lavoie was a second round draft pick who uh, six foot four uh, sniper um, starting to come into his own down in the AHL. So so yeah, I understand this. You want to give him competition, and you say, well, if the guy that we signed and the rookie can't beat out these two guys, then, yeah, one of these two guys is going to win a spot. Yeah, I do think also part of it is, you know, even if Sam Gagne doesn't make Edmonton, you'll see a lot of guys, a lot of veterans sign a PTO, do well in the preseason, don't crack the roster, then sign somewhere else. So I think Brandon Sutter is from Alberta. I could be wrong. So I think Edmonton... What? You don't know about the Sutters from Alberta who've had, like... 30 I knew they brothers. were from Western Canada. I didn't remember if it was Edmonton specifically. So I think it's not all... Edmonton. Viking. You of all people should know that they're from Viking, Alberta. Okay. Anyway, I do know of the Sutter family, of course. I didn't remember exactly where they're from. So they've given their hometown player a uh, uh, you know a contract, a PTO to give him a favor, and then Sam Gagne is just the honestly the heart and soul of the worst era of the Edmonton Oilers the Neil Yakupov era as it probably shall be known I guess some people could call it the Taylor Hall era but I think 
uh, Nail Yakupov's career trajectory kind of summarizes the Oilers mm-hmm. in that time period. So yeah. I, I do think they're also kind of being like, all right, we'll give you a chance to just make the NHL in general too. Is kind of what I'm thinking as I look at them next to each other. Uh, next up, Alex Chason. I think it could be interesting. It, it Alex Chason with the physical player he was, you know, a career fourth, fourth and third liner. Uh, you know, going to Boston, I feel like that kind of works. Uh, that, like that's the thing. These are like the most notable names I could find on the. Yeah, well, uh, Alex Chason. I mean, it's interesting that the next name you've got on the list is Dingleberries because he is definitely like a Dingleberry. He he just will not go away. He gets all these PTOs and he just hangs around in the NHL. And I really, I really respect that guy. I mean, he's a Stanley Cup winner and he's been on like this will be like his third PTO and he always seems to find himself a contract. Yeah, he's probably he probably is also good at the politics of the NHL too, but he's definitely good back it up but i do find that interesting uh next up we have ryan dezingle hurricanes legend ryan (laughs) dezingle um you know i just i I pointed him out because i'm rooting for him he was a really good player for ottawa not as much for carolina but he you know he did he was a solid depth player for carolina uh wasn't what you expected when you got him from ottawa but yeah so i think it's an interesting move arizona despite on ice, they have a plan. Off ice, when it comes to an actual building and city to play in, they don't. But yeah. on ice, they do seem to have a plan. So, it you know, will, go ahead. It will be uh, interesting to see if he can crack the lineup. And Arizona could actually be a pretty deep team this year. Yep. So, what were you going to say? Well, you brought up Carolina, Carolina legend. Um, I was thinking of you with the, when I was looking at the NHL is publishing its top 50 player list. And um, I just thought the way I measure players and their value and, you know, would I trade player A for player B? And when I saw that Sebastian Ajo was ranked number 46 on the 50 player list oh. and William ne- William Nylander was ranked number 41, I just thought, okay. Would Jonathan, would you be happy if the Hurricanes traded Aho for Nylander one for one? That would probably kill Hurricane Review for a month. <laughs> I, would, I would be so devastated. I don't even think I could tune into the games. And I like William Nylander. I think William Nylander would look good in a Hurricanes jersey. So I'm not insulting William Nylander by saying that. I just, Aho is, and Aho being below top 20 players in the league for me is a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, it's just, that's how I have to, I mean, that's how I assess everything. When they're talking about, oh, Nathan McKinnon and, and, uh, you know, I had, I had one disingenuous idiot on Twitter when I was like, uh, you know, they were saying uh, someone posted that they thought McKinnon was better uh, than, than McDavid couple of years ago i said well that's uh, that's fine but i certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't trade them uh, one for one and 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 the guy said yeah well i wouldn't trade mckinnon for mcdavid so there's that i would, I would yeah trade, i would trade mcdavid for any player in the league i mean i just think that that's if you that's if if you're if you're assessing how good a player is um that's that's sort of the measure is whether whether who would who you think would win that win that trade yeah would, no, you, would you do it for your team yeah that, that's a fair thing and then lastly i have more interesting because i'm kind of shocked that he is already at this point in his career needing a pto and that's colin white uh the only reason i'm kind of surprised is you know so I, I know you're not a gamer or anything um Obviously, I know you probably are playing Diablo 4 all the time. But uh, Colin White, I remember he did a GM mode for Ottawa, and Colin White did amazing for me there. So I always had him in the back of my mind a few years ago. But he's 26, and he's already having to sign a PTO. So it looks like his career hasn't gone the way a lot of people expected it to go. Uh, obviously, he's signed in my division, so I hope he doesn't do well in Pittsburgh. But I do hope he does kind of turn things around there. Yeah, I think uh, I think what you're seeing is a, is a lot of it is 
the guys are getting caught in this this salary cap crunch so that you know there's no middle class in hockey anymore and i just you know i i don't know white specifically but you see guys that didn't get a contract because teams are just tapped out they just can't they just can't do it so they're kind of holding out for for what they want what they feel their value is worth and they wind up having to you know well everyone's everyone's capped out so now if you're going to get a contract it's going to have to be through a pto um and maybe not even at the beginning of the season yeah well you know uh, but don't worry though gary bettman has assured us the cap will go up uh so yeah. <laughs> but yeah that's uh that is pretty interesting but uh dad i mean i have a question who would you if you were ranking the top 10 players uh, i can go back up? Yeah. Hmm? Who would Go you ahead. scare the top 10 players in the NHL right now to close this off, I guess? Well, I mean, I think it's pretty easy um, in, in no particular order. I might uh, might run out of gas here, but obviously McDavid, Dreisaitl, McKinnon, um, Matthews, um, let's see, McCarr. Um, those, those, are, those are probably my, uh, my top five. Remind me of some other names. Uh, there's Aho, Slavin. Uh, I don't have I don't have them in my top. Uh, Ovechkin, top 10. I think you could still put no. an argument. No, uh, he's not there. Trevor Zegers. Uh, I don't think Trevor Zegers is there. But he's no, there. he's not even close. He's not even close. He's not even in the not even in the top fifty. As I'm concerned. Uh, Vasilevsky. Uh, hey, you got to put a couple goalies. I mean, yeah. Shister and one of the one of those types of goalies. But anyway, I, I gave you the the na- the. Yeah my top five yeah those, those top five i think that is the top five consensus but i find it interesting because i would say aho is arguably top 10 in the league when you really look he's at close him. that's what i'm saying he's not 46 he's probably uh he's probably in the you know top 10 maybe uh, you know bumping up against the top 10 yeah it probably drives the nhl crazy that a hey, sorry my dog is wanting attention um, it probably drives the NHL absolutely insane that a market as small as Raleigh is one of the best run organizations in the league right now. Although no. they're in Gary's special category of Southern markets. So they're, they're, they're happy. Well, they're definitely not in ESPN's happiness right now. ESPN is like, it's either like if you're not LA, New York, Chicago, a team in Texas, or, you know, just it, Toronto, I think it's a little bit of love because they kind of are the one team for all of the Canadian markets. But if you're not one of those teams, ESPN does not like you. Like, Well, I'll, I'll beg to differ. I'll, I'll one exception to that. And it's sort of probably much to sh- Gary's chagrin. And if you saw the look on his face when he turned over the Connor McDavid draft card, that's all you need to know. But the number one, uh, the number one team uh, showing up on ESPN this year, ESPN games, is in fact the Edmonton Oilers. They have the most games scheduled on ESPN this year. Sure. So they're starting to recognize the star power, but yeah, they generally don't like the small markets, but McDavid has reached a height uh, and with dry sidle, there's enough star power there that at least the uh, um, ESPN is recognizing that they can market it. Yeah, and they also have a Vander Kane, who was a bit of a big name for his days. And I would say San Jose is what made him a big name. He's always been a good player, but he definitely became well-known with San Jose and a controversial uh, figure in the NHL at that, but yeah, it is interesting. I mean, you do have to televise Connor McDavid. I think that's the way ESPN sees it, but I don't. I think ESPN would be very happy if uh, Edmonton traded Connor McDavid to LA. I oh, think boy. they yeah. would just cream their pants if that happened. But uh, yeah, that's it for this one, everyone. Thank you guys for watching this. If you guys like the content we're producing on the channel, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Stay horny, my friends. And we'll see you guys soon with another edition of Hurricane Review. The 10th episode will be the next one. So see you guys then.